would like, uh, if I may, to take you on a strange journey. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Real Estate Realities with the Rebel Broker. My name's Robert Whitelaw, and I am the Rebel Broker. Licensed real estate broker in the state of California, member of the National Association of Real Tours. But please don't hold that against me. Welcome to it, folks. We've got a couple of interesting things to talk about today. As promised, we're going to hit a Home Union's list of the best investment markets for the first quarter of 2017. That's going to be a nice one that segues out of yesterday's show, uh, which I think was far more informative, probably in areas that you probably should be moving out of. Uh, And these would be areas that you'd want to move to if you're trying to move your investment dollars. So we'll cover that. We've also got another little interesting tidbit as everything moves more toward automation. We're going to talk about that. But this time, it's not just general automation. We've talked about how, in my opinion, we're going to see a huge, uh, like, new style, 21st century industrial revolution uh, as it relates to all kinds of things. Uh, We've talked about robots that build homes, uh, automated systems to drive your car. Um, Trucking is going to be affected. All kinds of things are going to be affected. And we've talked about how that's going to really change the landscape of, of, of jobs that folks have. Uh, but we haven't really talked too much about specific things going on in the world of real estate. So I thought we'd hit that today, too. So stay tuned for all that real estate goodness. Now, before we jump into it, I'd like to remind everyone how to get in touch. You can head on over to therebelbroker.com. From there, you can click the word contact in the menu bar, and you can send along any ideas, suggestions, observations, or questions that you might have. While you're there, why not submit your uh, entry into winning a $50 Amazon gift card? It is super easy to do, and at the same time, you're helping the show. The $50 gift card is my way of thanking folks for going to the trouble of doing that. Just click the big red button at the top of the page titled Take the Survey to Support the Show. Uh, You'll be asked your email address twice. Use the same email address both times. You'll be asked a handful of demographic-style questions, and you are done. You have helped me grow the show, but you have also got yourself in that drawing for that $50 Amazon gift card. Now, we've been doing this every month. So far, we've given away, I don't even know, 400 bucks, I think, but we'll be doing it again uh, for May, coming at the end of this week, so 5 p.m. Friday. May 12th, we'll be doing a drawing. So if you get yourself entered before then, you will be uh, in the running for potentially winning this $50 gift card. So good luck to you and congratulations to all the folks who've already won. Finally, if you'd like to join the Rebel Underground, you can text the word Rebel Broker to the number 44222. That's the word Rebel Broker to the number 44222 from any cell phone. Uh, Reply to the prompt. It'll make sure you know who you're dealing with. It'll reply in a way that lets you know you're dealing with the Rebel Broker. Uh, And then proceed from there, and you'll be all set. You'll get on the Rebel Underground list, and you'll get access to exclusive content and other fun stuff. So feel free to join in there. So which should we start off with? Let's go ahead and start off with the automation stuff first. Uh, There have been other stories we've covered where uh, we've talked about the probabilities of real estate agents being replaced with uh, automation systems. And I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, A, I don't think it's a bad thing. I mean, I realize uh, that there's, (laughs) I I talk to agents who are concerned about it, Um, I think that there will always be a place for agents who actually differentiate themselves from something above and beyond an automated system. The problem is, is that far too many agents today run their businesses in in a way that if you were to have a technologist look at how that real estate agent is doing business, the first thing that would pop into that person's head is that process could be automated. Um, Think of the contract as a, as a, a program. That says, you know, line one says pay X. All right, put the amount to be paid in the field, right? This is how much money we're talking about. Um, Seller to pay 
transfer fee, boom. It, these are just variables in a program. And there's a day these things will happen. So you've got a date, you've got an action, and you know a th- act, and when it's supposed to happen, when it's supposed to happen, and how much it's supposed to represent, whose signature is supposed to be there. Of course, that entire system could be automated. Right now, uh, real estate agents simply call that the team. Uh, so there's, there is there is no... Other than being a coordinator of the escrow, too many agents see their job not as carefully shepherding a process through completion, but rather just at a at a at the minimum living up to the terms of the contract. And let's be honest: uh, for those of you who've been through a real estate transaction, there is a sloppy willingness on the part of the vast majority of agents to not even live up to the minimum requirement of release this contingency on this day. Uh, Let me give you an example. I have one of my agents who just closed escrow today on a transaction. The person on the other side of the transaction, uh, if I remember right, was a pretty well-known agent. Um, Someone who definitely, you know, we were talking about virtue signaling (laughs) the other day. And this is an agent that just talks about how busy they are and how, how much they've got to do. And they're getting this award. And, you know, so there was a lot of this weird stuff that has nothing to do with the deal, but the time would come and go for a release of a contingency and it just wouldn't get done. Um, the, the responsible agents out there, and I know they're out there. I like to think I'm one of them. I know the folks who work for me are among those number. Um, take their job very seriously. So when it comes time on a certain date for a certain thing to occur, the expectation is it occurs. And a lot of us have to act like babysitters and point to the other side and say, where is the release of contingencies for this? Now, what's super interesting is in her experience and in my experience with other offices, even though they have people on the team that are supposed to make these things happen on time, they don't. Can't really figure that one out. I mean, you've got one job, you wait for a date to happen, and then you do something. Uh, that's the question of populating your calendar with things. Um, so the long and the short of it is that that entire process is very easily automated. So if you're an agent who's not adding anything above and beyond that, what value are you really bringing? Why should you earn a commission? Why shouldn't an end user, an owner of a home, be able to simply go to a website, enter their address and say, I would like to sell this place. And then a whole bunch of automatic gears start happening. Maybe someone shows up to take photos. Maybe someone shows up to put a lockbox on the door. You know? Uh, of course, showing a house is a little bit more involved because it's it's one of the things that an agent is supposed to do is make sure that the folks who are coming into your home to view it are conducting themselves in a, in a proper way. They're not filling up their pockets with all your personal possessions and running out the door with them, those types of things. Um, and these things are all things that I think can very easily be worked out. But what's going to make and, and what worries me is that the same system will simply continue to exist except now these agents that are so good at getting signatures up in the front end won't have to actually pay anyone on a team. <laughs> they'll, they'll be able to continue doing what they're doing, but they'll just have the whole process automated and never even deal with uh, the escrow. When it comes time for you as a buyer to sign off on the loan contingency, the automated system will simple, simply send you an email directing you to a signature place on DocuSign to go and sign to release those contingencies. And that'll be it. And it'll make the, the problem worse. That that's Unfortunately, that's the way my brain tends to lean. But I, could, I guess I hold out hope. I hold out hope that, that once there's a contrast between agents that actually do their job uh, and go in there and negotiate hard and plan for contingencies that may come up during an escrow, um, and maybe then we'll be able to actually start judging agents on the things I think they should be judged by. You know, if you start a co- an escrow, how often do you close it? If you list a home for X amount of dollars, how often do you get that or more compared to other homes in the market? How long does it take you to sell a home? Does it take you less time than the average in that area or more than the average in that area? I would love to live in that world. I have No, I do not. My heart does not skip a beat. I do not feel one bit of stress over the idea of being judged on how I do my job. 
which is probably not how most agents would feel. Okay, so having said all that, having having mentioned how easily automatable everything is, let's go ahead and talk real quickly about a story out of North Carolina. Now, according to the good folks over at Housing Wire, North Carolina has officially completed its first ever e-closing. That means that the escrow process was done virtually. You didn't have to go in and deal with a lot of paper or all these other types of things. For those of you who have gone through this process, and for me, as who is someone that's investment-minded and potentially dealing with things that might not be in my backyard, this is wonderful. Now, North Carolina passed a major milestone in the housing finance industry, according to this article, last month by performing its first ever e-closing. The state and I'm still quoting the article here, along with North State Bank and the help of other key parties, executed a 100% electronic mortgage closing. Investors Title Insurance Company of Chapel Hill insured the electronic notarized mortgage, while Doc Magic and Worldwide Notary were the electronic solution providers that were used. Um, then there's some other goofy crap that really doesn't matter. Um, until the, up until this point, Anderson stated the majority of e-closings have been a proof of concept to test one or two, uh, various elements of the process. Um, and most did not pursue an e-closing as their standard way of doing business going forward. So this is it. I mean, they, once you've crossed this line and everyone sort of gets over the finish line and looks at each other and realizes, Hey, you know what? Nothing blew up. Nothing caught fire. Um, and people start to build confidence in a process like this and start to realize, you know, in, in a real sense, it has fewer failure points than the other way. Uh, when you've got people manually flipping through pages to figure out where signatures are supposed to go and you don't have a electronic way of evaluating whether or not numbers are correct. Right. I mean, I've still gone. I still go to closings where the papers are all out and people have their have their calculators out to figure out if all the numbers are right. Right. I'm sure some of you have been through that yourself. All of this can be automated. There should be a computer system on your end or, or a, a digital avatar, whatever you want to refer to it as a digital representative on your side that simply just takes all the numbers and make sure all of it adds up. Right. Now, this news, according to the article, marks a major event in history for North Carolina, but it's not the first ever e-closing. In 2016, Radius Financial Group partnered with Doc Magic, the MERS Loan Registry, Fannie Mae, and Santander Bank to complete the long-anticipated e-mortgage. The group closed six loans in a completely paperless process, utilizing both lender and closing settlement agent documentation, e-notarization, e-warehousing, and e-note acceptance through Doc Magic's closing solution. So it's not a brand new thing. And in fact, I think we may have talked about this back in 2016 when it happened for the first time. But I think that this is something we're going to see growing. Uh, and as as people start to realize how technology works and start to realize all the systems you can build into this that double check and verify and make sure that numbers are correct and can catch errors earlier, uh, you're going to find a lot of things happen. And while this is going to streamline the process for you as a buyer or seller or investor, it's not going to spell good news for folks who are currently escrow coordinators. Uh, because what you'll also find is that on the real estate agent side, there will be systems that will communicate with these systems so that all of the really uh, basic level tracking of a date stuff is all going to be handled automatically. And in the perfect world, in the world where we actually expect real estate agents to do the bulk of their work negotiating the contract and, and maintaining control over the escrow, they would be able to focus not on the goofy stuff of a date or any of like thing like that. They'd be able to focus on not the, the quantity or timing of how things get done, but the quality of what gets done. And let's be honest, that's the missing part in, in real estate service today. I think that the one reason why real estate agents are so maligned rightfully is there's none of them really break out in terms of quality. Um, and, and, and we have to understand what quality is. Quality doesn't mean that when the escrow closes, they send you a gift basket. Quality doesn't mean that they're the one who dazzle in that listing presentation. It means that when it comes time to fight for your price on an offer, they fight for your price. It means that when it comes time to get into escrow and you're 
and your agent is representing you as a buyer, they're keying into things so that you can buy that property as intelligently as possible. So maybe as an agent, you what you would, or as a buyer, what you would normally get is just a general property inspection, right? But then maybe because your agent has noticed a few things, he says, you know, uh, he or she says, I think we should also get inspection X, Y, or Z, right? Whatever, whether it's a roof inspection or maybe maybe he has seen something in the electrical system. Maybe it's because there's something unusual about that property. Maybe there's a thing that should deserve some extra attention and, an, and another person should be, should be consulted about that. Maybe it comes down to when a con, when a a uh, complication crops up in the escrow, you have someone in there who can come up with a plan to overcome it. That's what the goal is. The goal is for your agent to overcome obstacles to ma- to facilitate you reaching your goals. Now, I have a perfect example of a client I'm working with right now who their current lender pulled the rug out from under them and now I'm helping them connect with a new lender. I am making that process work better by showing them other options. Now, these are first-time buyers. They were very intimidated by this by this uh, setback and we're getting past it, right? So there's the long and the short of it, and I realize I've already given you the long, I apologize, is that There will be a place for agents who absolutely give the better level of service, who absolutely pay attention to the details. Um, But my but uh, my concern is that what we'll see is that we simply get more of the same, that in 10 years, I will still be telling you that 80 percent, 90 percent of agents out there stink and that they're not really focusing their attention on the things they should be focusing their attention on. They'll still be proudly proclaiming that they're closing 100, 200, 300 escrows a year when when you do the math, it makes you realize there's no way that that agent is able to give their clients personalized attention and really um, do the most for their clients. And frankly, those the folks who aren't providing that level of time to their clients are not earning their money. Um, so there you go. All right. All right. Next, we're going to jump in and quickly run through, uh, the best markets for real estate investors in the first quarter. We'll see some interesting numbers here. Uh, and, and some of these are going to sound familiar from our discussion last yesterday. Let's see which ones don't go away. We'll be right back. Are you ready to jump in and start your search for your first investment property? Maybe you've decided that it's time to own your own home, or maybe you're ready to sell your home and move on to something new. No matter what your goal is, The Rebel Broker can help. That's right. Aside from hosting this show, I am also the owner broker of White Lawn Sons Real Estate Services right here in Silicon Valley. With over 25 years experience serving Silicon Valley, Morgan Hill, San Martin, and Gilroy, I or one of my great agents can help you achieve your goals in real estate. So if you're ready to look into taking that next step towards achieving your real estate goals, point your browser at www.soldbyrobert.com. That's www.soldbyrobert.com robert.com and get in touch. Let me show you how I will earn your business and your respect. Again, that's www.soldbyrobert.com or you can call me at 408-852-0525. California Bureau of Real Estate ID 00984909. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Thanks so much for sticking with me. Today, this is a good chunk of data. This is data we cover just about every quarter, and it's where we look back, uh, where if you had purchased a property one year ago, where would you be today on on your return on that investment? Um, it's a great way to turn your gaze to the most profitable places to put your money. If you're an investor in an area that might be one of the ones we talked about yesterday that have seen the greatest amount of price growth, maybe it makes sense to back out and pull it into areas where prices are a little bit uh, better and maybe you're able to get a little bit better of an aggressive deal, but at the same time are giving you the highest rates of return. Now, uh, this is from Home Union. These are the folks that we use when we cover this one. Uh, They're an online real estate investment management firm. And it's the top 10 best housing markets for single family rental home investors in the first quarter. Uh, We can also, if we have time, we probably won't. We're already pretty far along. But it's also fun to look at the worst markets for a return. Because as it always tends to be, it tends to be some of those super hyped markets And there's one city that has shown up on this market, although the worst, 
that hurts my feelings. So we'll talk about that one too. We'll at least bring that one up. But let's go ahead and run down the list here real quick. Um, Number 10, and this is one that has appeared on this list before. Uh, It is one that we have talked about in terms of attractiveness uh, for other reasons in terms of drawing people uh, drawing people in uh, and, and being a good investment area. Philadelphia, uh, in the investment home price, $148,900. Their year over year change is 13.7%. And that gives us a cap rate of 8%. So not horrible. Um, I know a lot of investors out there that are always shooting for uh, a 10% cap rate. Uh, but that's, I think, very respectable. And remember, these are these are all averaged out. So, you know, more shrewd searching, finding, buying can, can always net you better results. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is number nine at ninety five thousand four hundred and eighty nine bucks uh, down four point five percent year over year, but still a respectable eight percent cap rate. St. Louis, Missouri, ninety six thousand four hundred and twelve. These are all fantastic, great uh, in terms of uh, not a huge barrier to entry in terms of acquiring some of these properties. So that's good news. St. Louis, 96,412, 8.3% year over year change with an 8.1% cap rate. Same, uh, excuse me, so just 0.1 over Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. Next on our list is Indianapolis, $101,948 is the investment home price uh, with a 6.5% year over year change an 8.1% cap rate, so tied for St. Louis in terms of rate of return. Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, $97,960. Investment home price, 22.4% year-over-year change. That's a pretty impressive year-to-year change with an 8.1% cap rate. Uh, And by the way, uh, I don't think any of the cities we've talked about so far have not been on some of our good lists. Uh, I'm looking up at the top of the list and then I think there's might be one surprise city on this list, but I'm not sure it sound it does sound like it's familiar from at least some of the lists we've reviewed over the last few quarters. Uh, we just talked about Oklahoma city. Next is Richmond, Virginia, $121,682 for a single family residential investment property, 5.8% year over year change with an 8.2% cap rate. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee, 80, and we've talked about Memphis a lot. Memphis has propped up on a lot of lists. It's been on this list. It's been on lists relating to not only um, uh, in terms of rentals, which is this list, but also appreciation uh, in terms of attractiveness to buyers. It's shown up on a ton of different lists. So M- Memphis has been on there enough that, that I think it is is one of those cities that should probably be on anybody's radar once they start deciding for themselves if they're going to invest in a city outside of their area. Uh, if you're if you're somewhere near Memphis, I really don't think there's any excuse to not at least be poking around in that marketplace to see what you find. Okay, so Memphis, Tennessee, 86,975 bucks for that single family residential investment home rental. 1.1% year over change with an 8.5% cap rate. Columbia, South Carolina, 94,372 comes in at number 3 with a 4.9% increase over the year and an 8.6% cap rate. Next on our list is Cincinnati. Now, if I'm remembering correctly, Cincinnati uh, is another one. And again, another, this, this is one that's been on this list before. I think it's actually higher on the list than it was uh, last time. I think it was fourth last time we checked this list. Now, they're coming in at $87,092 as a home investment price. Now, one thing I want, as you're going through this list, keep in mind numbers, right? We, we talk about investments. We talk about barrier. When I'm, when I'm talking about barriers to entry, I'm, I'm usually talking to that person who's been thinking a lot about what they want to do and, and they want to invest, but maybe they're afraid, they're concerned. Um, but let's, let's take this for a second and think about it. So we just talked about Cincinnati, $87,092 for an investment home. Well, that means that for a 20% down payment, you need to come up with 17,418 bucks. Um, And I think, you know, that is a good chunk of change for an awful lot of folks. Uh, That is not the lowest amount to acquire on this list. We'll actually see the lowest in our number one spot. Um, But I think that this is a manageable amount of money. And if it's not manageable for you as an individual, 
it may be manageable for you to do it if you bring in someone with some money to participate in the investment with you. Now, that's always dicey. We've talked about this before. Always write up a very strong contract to cover all potential eventualities if you decide to partner with someone. But, you know, if you get one of these things going and can generate some income, uh, I think these are great ways to get started. And while this is focused on rentals, obviously it's more of a buy and hold strategy, we'll cover in the in the future in future shows properties or areas that have seen the greatest return on investment because of appreciation. Um, I, some of the investors I know today that I've known for a really long time are folks who started off buying a property with two or three other people, and then they remodeled it and flipped it. So, and and then those folks went off and maybe instead of having three or four partners on a deal, it was only two of them. And then once they did that deal, maybe they were able to do the next deal themselves. My point I'm trying to get at here is that there are sol- there are pathways that can be solutions to things that you feel like are standing in the way of you move- moving forward with these types of projects. So don't let them stop you if if you if you're someone who's all and maybe it's subconscious. We've talked about how these these things that hold us back can often be perfectly rational sounding, intelligent thought processes that where the end of the equation equals don't do it. And you you need to you need to not embrace that. You need to think of it as a problem. If if the solution to the problem is to not do it, you need to find a new solution. Because if you can, if you're always able to intelligently and in a and in, in a perfectly rational way come up with a reason to not do it, that's pretty much where you're going to land all the time. Okay. So Cincinnati, we already talked about $87,092 is the acquisition price for that single family residential uh, rental property. Year over year change is an increase of 11.4%. Pretty darn respectable. It's the second highest on our, third highest on our list so far with Oklahoma City actually being in the number one position uh, and a cap rate of 9.8%. So just shy of 10%. Totally respectable. I like it. Good numbers. It's got a great combination. It's got a great cap rate. It's got, it shows, it's showing growth. In the year over year, the only thing I'd be worried about is where are we in that growth? Do we feel like there's more headroom in that growth? And if there's not, do we want to do some math to figure out if you saw a year over year decrease, how bad would that hurt your cap rate? And just be prepared for that. Have numbers set aside to figure out what happens under that eventuality. And the the cost of acquisition is relatively low. So that's great. Now, the next one. And this one deserves the number one spot for a bunch of different reasons. This is Cleveland, Ohio. Um... You know, I'm still itching to talk to someone who has actually invested in Cleveland. If you're an investor who's invested in Cleveland, reach out to me. I would love to talk to you about your experience and how it's been going for you. I don't know a lot about Cleveland. I know Cleveland had a lot of troubles in the 90s. Uh, I, I know that a lot of business left, but I also know that Cleveland's been doing some things to try to revitalize the city. That's another thing we've talked about that I think Cleveland was on a list of different cities that have sort of reinvented themselves. Um But I'd love to get some ground truth on it because Cleveland is another one of those sort of sleeper communities that I don't hear a lot of people talking about that continues to show up on a lot of different lists. So here we go. Cleveland, cost of acquisition. This is the lowest cost of acquisition out of all in the top 10. If you wanted to buy a property in uh, Cleveland, and we assume that uh, this average is is a representative number, you would only need to come up with $15,000 cash to be 20% down on a purchase in Cleveland. That's pretty awesome. Uh, The year-over-year change is up 16.2%. So just like we were talking about with Cincinnati, that's a great change, right? So again, do the math, figure it out. Have we reached a peak? Are we, or is this sort of a flat thing that's happening? With a cap rate of 11.5%, so not a little bit, above Cincinnati, nearly two full percentage points above Cincinnati. That's respectable. Now, remember, these are all averages. If you're going in it with the right kind of mindset, if you're going in there looking for the right kinds of transactions, you're likely to be able to get better than those numbers. Some folks will get less because that's what an average means. It means if if you have an average number, some folks got less and some folks got more. But isn't it nice to know that you're starting from a position where the average person is scoring an 11.5% cap rate? All right. Now, that covers the top 10. We've got another minute or two here. So let's selectively look at a few of the communities that are rounding out the bottom 10, the worst returns on investment. Um, Now, remember, we're talking about percentages here. So we're going to talk much bigger numbers in terms of the cost to acquire in these areas. 
And imagine if you had taken some of these amounts, which are, you know, in some cases over a million dollars, had invested it in a Cleveland where that million dollars would have bought you not, we've got the number one worst here is 1.1 million. Imagine an environment where instead of buying one property in San Francisco, you brought bought 11 properties in Cleveland and made 11.5% on each one of those. So in other words, you're paying $25,000 more per property anyway. You're assuming you're buying something that's more expensive in the Cleveland marketplace, but you're making 11.5%. Or, or about, you might make a little bit less because of the higher acquisition price. But wouldn't it be nice to have 11 properties? Imagine if some don't rent, you're still making money. In, in, in the number one worst metro, which is San Francisco, where it's 1.1 million, you lose one month's rent. That's 100% of your money for that month, right? So let's talk about San Francisco. San Francisco's number one, investment home price acquisition for a rental, $1,118,702. Year-over-year change of 9.7% with a cap rate of 2.8 on that. The next worst, the number two worst, man, California is really well represented on this list. San Jose, California, in my backyard, we've talked about San Jose before, $928,355 investment, uh, average home investment price for last year. Um, now, remember, when we were talking about San Jose just the other day, they were trying to tell us that the average price in 2016 was 800 and something thousand bucks. So that's just wrong. Uh, And then San Francisco was 900 and something. So clearly these numbers are are different. Uh, But again, these are also for single family residentials. Maybe when you add in condos and townhomes, things get different. Uh, So for San Jose, the year over year change was 12.8% with a 2.8% cap rate. So same cap rate in both locations. Uh, Orange County was number three on the worst list. Los Angeles was number four on the worst list. San Diego was number five on the worst list. Also, and we and Oakland's on the worst list. Portland, Oregon's on the worst list. Salt Lake City, Utah's on the worst list. Seattle, or Seattle, Washington's on the worst list. One city that's on the worst list that makes me want to cry a little bit inside is Sacramento, California. It's number seven on the worst list with a three hundred and thirteen thousand eight hundred and forty five dollar investment home acquisition uh, cost. Year over year change eighteen point four percent. The cap rate, 4%. Um, What's interesting about Sacramento is this is one that's migrated. If I'm not mistaken, when we first started talking about Sacramento, when I first started getting a little bit excited about Sacramento, this was about a year ago. And on a list like this, Sacramento was in the top 10. Obviously, prices have changed, right? I still continue to get uh, emails from my good buddy, Scott Blasius up in Sacramento. So if you're looking for a really good agent to help you find something in Sacramento, Scott Blasius is your guy. But I have noticed as things have been coming in that the that prices have absolutely been going up. Now, that is a situation where uh, that obviously negative, negatively affects what we're seeing here. So it's a bummer. It looks like uh, the boat may have been missed on being able to leverage out an awful lot. Sacramento is only showing a 4% cap rate. Uh, it has an 18.4% a year over year change, kind of a bummer. Um, when I run the math on various things that I see that Scott sends me via his search, uh, I still see stuff where I could get a, a relatively reasonable return. So I think there are still places to find in Sacramento, but it has definitely migrated over. It's gotten it, a lot of the opportunity has been taken out of that community. And that's one of the interesting things to see in terms of the, the shifts in these marketplaces. Now, San Francisco, San Jose, a lot of, and Oakland and all, a lot of these California communities. Now, remember there was also a time a, a while back a year ago or, or more when Oakland was in the top 10 in terms of, re, of uh, cap rate return on investment. And now it's in the worst. It's in the, it's in the top 10 worst returns. So it's interesting to see these migrations and interesting to note so many of the ones that are on this list in the top 10 of good returns have really been here for a long time. These aren't these aren't end of the spectrum type communities, right? There's a certain stability. Uh, there's not these crazy fluctuations. So maybe there's something to be said for grabbing onto these places that tend to have a little bit less of these wild fluctuations and just a little bit more of a reliable uh, history to them that just shows that things just don't tend to go super crazy. Um, I'd be interested in in a lot of these to figure out. 
What are the primary things that make this economy run there? What are the what kind of diversity do you have in terms of business? Those types of things. But it's a great list for you to start with and figure out where do I want to go next or where do I want to migrate my investments to uh, in a way that will generate the greatest return for me. All right, folks. As is always the goal, I hope that you have managed to suck far more value out of the last 30 minutes uh, than it took you to invest your time. Uh, I am always very appreciative of the time that you spend with me. Thank you very much. Thanks again for listening, everyone. I'll talk to you all next time.